Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Poetry Book Society Instagram live video. Uh, my name's Andrew McMillan, and as usual, um, I'm going to be talking to you for about an hour tonight. We've got two fantastic poets um, joining us tonight, as I can see people um, coming in. You'll notice, first of all, the first thing that you'll notice is that I have a fancy new headset on. Yes, you're right. This is what the Poetry Book Society have given me. No expense spared. So I can do these Poetry Book Society Instagram book clubs, but I can also um, kind of land aircraft and work in traffic control, which is really nice as well. Um, so I hope you've all ha been having a good week so far. I can't believe the week's almost over again. Um, and it's National Poetry Day. So welcome, first of all, to National Poetry Day. And I hope you've had um, a really brilliant one. You've probably gorged on too many syllables. You've probably overstuffed on stanzas. You've loosened the buckle on your belt. You're sitting back. And this is going to be the poetic equivalent of the Queen's speech. And so I'll play the role of the Queen obviously um, and we'll sit back and for an hour we're going to just have a brilliant chat with two wonderful poets who were both Poetry Book Society Autumn Recommendations for 2020 um, curated by myself and the great Sinead Morrissey and so we have Nina Mingia-Powells and we have Mervyn Taylor um, and about 10 past um, 7 we're going to chat to Mervyn who's going to um, join us, going to read us a poem from the collection um, and then we're going to have a chat about his brilliant collection Country of warm snow and then about 25 to um, 8 will be joined by Nina who again will read to us from um, her brilliant collection Magnolia Mulan and then again kind of we'll hear from that book and we'll have a chat and Patricia's here as well she's had a very exciting National Poetry Day um, as well so she's all worn out from all the celebrations um, and excitement that she's had as well as you can hear. Um, we've got Mervyn, we've got Nina, I should remind you as well that as a special um, I guess celebration or a special gift um, to everyone for National Poetry Day um, we've got a special offer on at the, Nas at the um, Poetry Book Society at the minute which is that um, we, uh, if you join us and you choice member at the minute, you'll get a free Ocean Vong tote bag, which is this beautiful tote bag that's got a brilliant Ocean Vong quote on the side. Um, Patricia wears that often when she goes out walking around Newton Heath in North Manchester. Um, and you'll get a £10 book voucher to spend in the Poetry Book Society online store, um, which allows you to... Um, kind of buy any of the books that are either in the bulletin or just any of the wonderful books that are published. Uh, one of the really hard things about being a selector for the Poetry Book Society, I think, is that there are just so many good books that you might choose that, that get published every quarter. And so what we kind of end up being able to show you, I think, um, each quarter is just a small selection really of the great books and if you buy the bulletin if you get the bulletin each quarter one of the things I love about getting the bulletin is you can turn to the back and in the back is the kind of listing of all the books that were published that quarter that were submitted and that's always a really great thing just to I think see um, what's happening in poetry and to keep your keep kind of up to date I guess on what's happening. Um, so what else is is new this week? Um, I've changed my desk around, so I'm facing the other way. That's new. And so I've got the three kind of ghosts of National Poetry Day past, present, and then future behind my head now. Um, and so I thought that would be a bit of a nicer background, perhaps, for us, I think. Um, and so those three rather scary gentlemen will be looking over our shoulder um, as we do this event this evening um, and as we kind of go on through um, the readings. And so as I say, we've got two fantastic um, poets this evening who've written very different books, but books that I really recommend, and actually not for the first time this quarter and in all the selections, poets that represent really important and vital um, small presses as well and so um, Nina's publisher is Nine Archers Press who I know have turned up before on the Poetry Book Society lists and a relatively new press um, but have published some wonderful books over the last few years and really I think celebrate not only diverse voices but new voices and by new I don't just mean young um, I mean new voices whatever age they've come to poetry and I think Jane Kamein at Nine Archers has done a really wonderful job of really celebrating um, 
a lot of new poets um, and really kind of doing a great job of of expanding and pushing the boundaries of um, what what the British um, and UK poetry scene can really be. Um, and Mervyn Taylor published by Shearsman. Shearsman, one of my kind of all time favourite presses back in my naive youth. Um, I used to think that I might be a Shearsman poet. That was one of my ambitions, um, that I might one day kind of be published by Shearsman. And then I realised that I wasn't that cool, that I didn't um, that I didn't write that kind of poetry, perhaps. Um, but I still really always admired Shearsman. And Mervyn, we can see you there. We can see that you're there. We're going to bring you in in a second. Um, and so Mervyn is published by um, Shearsman, as I was saying, another one of those just really boundary-pushing um, small presses who, who I think are really exciting. Um, and so it's going to be a great event. In a couple of minutes, I'll bring um, Mervyn in. Mervyn will begin by reading us a poem. And then we're going to have a chat about his collection, Country of Warm Snow. And then um, about 25 to 8, um, we're going to bring Nina in and we'll follow that same format again. I much like having, much prefer having two poets. If you tuned into these earlier editions, I guess, of the book club, you'll know that we only had one poet um, per episode and that was just a long time to talk I think for me and for the poet but having two um, I think two per session seems seems like it works really well to me so let us know um, about that feedback you know if you've got feedback about that about the episodes as well um, what I might do Poetry Book Society tell me if this is okay just before I bring Mervyn in is I might unplug myself um, from this um, headset and just try it without the microphone for now just give me a nod if that's okay um, because otherwise I'm gonna have to hold my phone and I had a flu job today and so my arm is a bit heavy <laughs> and if I keep holding it I might dramatically drop it to the ground um, and then we'll have a real moment and so if that's okay just give me one second I'm gonna transition from that sound back to normal sound and just tell me if that's okay i can suddenly hear myself much clearer as well and it just means i can prop the phone up like that and you get a much better view of me and of patricia which i think is the reason that you're all really here and so um we'll get going with that first interview in just a second it's great to see so many people here i hope you have all had a great national poetry day of course every day is poetry day when you're a poet or when you're a fan of poetry but i always like this day because twitter and social media instagram is always just full up of the people sharing points of people being excited about poetry not necessarily people even tweeting their own poems but people going i read this poem this is my favorite poet and you get a real sense i think of that of that poetry community uh, which is so vital and that community that can really spring up around poetry and um, so I think that's a really great thing this is probably the last edition of this book club that we're going to do for the autumn selection so Nina and Mervyn's books this will probably be the last one I think we do because we're moving on now to the winter um, 2020 selections and so you will have seen hopefully um, some of those um, recommendations and curations for the winter um, 2020 um oh do you think patricia should wear the headset no i hope she's not too overbearing can you still hear me over patricia's kind of excited grunts and moans i hope so um and so the winter 2020 selections include fred de gard daisy lafarge uh, Ni aikwe parks there's a wonderful selection of poets there um as well and so um Without, so do check that out. If you join the Poetry Book Society now, um, you get um, that £10 book voucher, you'll get the Ocean Bomb tote bag and you'll get a copy of the Winter 2020 Bulletin as well. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first guest, the wonderful, wonderful Mervyn Taylor. I'm so excited about this interview. Um, Country of Warm Snow is just a fantastic book. Um, it was a real honour to be able to read for the Poetry Book Society and an honour to be able to choose. Um, for the Poetry Book Society as a recommendation for autumn um, and I'm just thrilled that we're going to be able to have this chat together um, and with all of you as well so again as always if you've got questions if you've got things you want to ask um, just throw that into the bottom of the um, text box and um, I can throw those questions to Mervyn as well so I'm just going to go into the um, list of guests so I can see everyone that's here and Mervyn's right at the top it's meant to be Mervyn's the first name on that list and so I'm going to go live with Mervyn and we're going to connect to him now. 
Patricia being excited. Just waiting for it to connect to Mervyn. Okay. Hello. Hey, thank you, Andrew. How, how are you? I'm pretty good. I hope you can see me okay. Yeah, yeah, we can. It looks, it looks great. It looks very beautiful. Okay, can you hear me as well? Yeah, perfect. Wonderful. Okay. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for joining us. Um, and I wondered if you'd like to just start off by reading us a poem from, um, from the collection. Absolutely. I thought I might begin with the very first poem in the book. It's called Status. And um, here we go. Sheriff, the African tailor on Flatbush, wants to learn English. He can speak it, but not write it. He's from Conakry. The word so wonderful, I say it again. Conakry. I offer him slips on which to write the names of his customers so he does not mix up the clothes. When we converse, I find myself imitating his accent, asking him where he learned tailoring skills so remarkable. The space where he sews it like a cupboard, his four countrymen squeezed in behind him. We discuss our cultures and talk about these new immigration laws how they affect so many. I have no idea what his status is. I only know that when I stand before the mirror, my old suit looks new and that I would hide him in my house and feed him whatever kind of soup it is they love over there. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that reading, Mervyn. And it's a great point to start on because I think I mean, I was going to ask this a little bit later on, but it strikes me one of the things that you can do so well in this collection is that you you can observe real people and, and you can capture these really small, you know, these small moments that I think other people might pass by or overlook. There's a point later on in the book where um, there's a barber and it, it, the point is set in the barbershop and outside there's kind of gunfire and violence, but we just kind of, we stay in the barbershop and we stay with that moment. And it seems to me that one of your real gifts is to is to kind of always be looking slightly off centre and to show us these people and these moments that might otherwise get passed by. You know, they're not going to make the headlines, but they're important. And I, you could, you know, is that what's important to you? I guess these kind of people who might not be the centre of the narrative, but it's important to show their lives. Yeah, I I try not to intrude on what they're doing or on their activity just to observe them and, and just observe how marvelous it is, the way that they cope with, with small things. Like I could sit there and watch that tailor put together uh, his whole outfit and, and, and so have somebody come in and wait. The whole drama and the interaction of them, which is a day-to-day -day thing. And to me, it's as important as all the big decisions, all the news about parliament and all the stuff that we are fooled with that the day-to-day, moment-to-moment activity of ordinary people just speaks worlds for, for all of us, you know. Definitely. And so I guess, I guess then, like, from your view then, the job of the poet isn't to sort of impose himself in a situation. It is just to, to be that observer, to almost stand slightly back and watch, and to be a recorder of things rather than be involved in the action somehow. Well, he, he's, but, but he, he's part of what's going on because somewhere in the poem, I think I will introduce myself as the recipient of something, you know, that as much as I may just want to look on, it affects me in some kind of way, right? That I'm, yes. I'm affected. Yeah. Yes. The, the, poem, the poem about the barber cutting hair and so on, um, outside it's a violent world, you know, and the bullets are flying. But uh, when the, uh, he makes his own lapse in the activity, because when, when a customer comes and shouts the word wedding, he, he knows he has to go to work. You know, he begins <laughs> clipping it. Yeah. Fantastic. It's a beautiful poem that I think that the way as you say that the world kind of keeps happening outside, but he, he knows he has that job and he has that kind of work to do. And one of yeah. the 
you'll have seen, like, we are, one of my jobs when I start, kind of choose these books is that I have to do a kind of mini write-up and a mini blurb for each of the collections. And one of the things that I ended up saying is that, as you're saying, I think these poems just seem exemplary to me in how they pay attention. They stay, they don't move their focus. Like, I think a lot of poets would see something and then look away very quickly. And it seems to me your work, there's a patience in kind of sitting in that space or in that moment. And even if it doesn't seem kind of exciting at first, you know that something might happen or, or you might have to be involved. But the kind of patience in, in, in knowing that you have to stay and watch that thing, I think, isn't there? That something will happen. Yeah. That if you stay with it long enough, Something will take place. You know, it's like I, I, the first time I went to that tailor shop, for example, I, I, I looked around at what looked like confusion, you know, just like a hundred bags of clothes just hanging all over, you know. And I'm wondering how is he coping with this, you know. And then on another day, I see somebody come in and he takes like about half an hour to find what he's looking for. And I make the suggestion, I say, well, maybe I could give you some slips of paper and you could put the names on and so on. And he to, I gave him the, the, the little sheaf of paper and he listened for a minute. But the very next time I went in there, it was the same thing. And it seems to me that that's... Uh, something to do with um, the ordinary person and to do with an African culture, right? Mm -hmm. That there's no hurry. We will take our time and find what belongs to you, you know. It may be frustrating, but look, we get a chance to sit and chat with each other while I search and go crazy looking for your clothes. You know? <laughs> the, the whole idea of, um, of, of coping with, with the situation. And that in every walk of life, it's the same, right? That, that there's a lesson being, a lesson to be learned each time. Yes. That, that patience is an important part of the lesson, you know? So these are not, I don't think the poet has to always declare what he thinks is important or to, to point the way or to, or to sum up or to, or to come to some conclusion. I think I think the po the poem and the people in the poem create their own conclusion eventually, you know, and that basically you should support. I think too often tries to add his own sense to what's going on, and I think if the poet listens long enough, he too will learn something from what's happening. He doesn't have to proclaim or anything. You know? I think that's such an important thing to say, isn't it? I think especially for when we first start out as poets, when we're young, we think that that's what poets have to do, isn't it? That poets kind of declaim and the poets kind of find the truth and they have to say it. And I love that idea that the poet maybe doesn't have to kind of reach that conclusion or the poet can just kind of wait and see what, you know, they don't have to kind of come to a conclusion. I think that's such a beautiful idea. Yeah. And also, I, um, one of the tricky things about poetry is how to how to end the poem, you know, how to conclude. And it's something that I, I had to really, really work at. And I think at some point I managed to, to find a solution to that, you know, because the poem has to come to its own natural ending. But at the same time, I cannot miss out on the excitement of what life provides, right? That that is, there's a lesson in that last line. And I, I remember when I was in class, I remember Derek Walker uh, co commenting about my ending being a little bit shrill, you know, like, like a pring on the piano at the end, you know. And and I think I never forgot that lesson. And I think from no, I have worked at making sure that, that an ending is its own ending, that I am not providing it, you know, that the poem has its ending already, built in, you know. Yeah. That's some status. Um, there's something about the, 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 the language. Um, I mean, I've never been to Africa, but I've heard Africans talk. And there's a way, if, if we look at the last line where he says, I will, I will give him soup or whatever it is they love over there. The line remains so open that I can add, if at readings I do this, I can give him soup or, 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 or rice or sausage or what, I can keep adding to that last line. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm just putting my just phones back in, um, Mervyn, um, but we can hear you fine. I think that's yeah, so man. fascinating and I think... Um, 
because you mentioned Derek Walcott. There's a poem for Derek Walcott in the book as yes. well. And because yes. um, I mean, some people watching this might not know that um, that connection that you had to him. And I just wonder if you could say a little bit about that. I know he was an important, an important figure for you. Well, I just remember growing up that he was very active in Trinidad and he, he had founded the Th Trinidad Theatre Workshop. And it just happened that when I um, went to, to graduate school in Columbia, he was one of the people teaching, teaching me there. And the luck I had is that I had um, Walcott and Brodsky at the same time. So to watch the friendship between these two guys, you know, to watch the banter between them. And I, and I think sometime during that term, uh, Walker brought Brodsky to Trinidad, you know. And when, when Brodsky came back, um, his comment was, he says, well, he says, I, I, what news do I have from your homeland? I must say that Port of Spain is pretty uh, squalid, <laughs> and the word, <laughs> well, it, but it was it wasn't an insult as much as it was a sort of poetic observation, <laughs> because, and then and then going on to see, to hear him talk about how the, how hard it must be for people from from these islands to 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 sit inside writing poetry when. Poetry is right outside your door, you know, the waves are crashing and the, and the light is there, you know. And Walcott, of course, is able to sit on a beach and make poems out of the waves coming up on the sand. He does it over and over and over. Yeah. But these two friends, uh, it was amazing just to watch them uh, and watch them uh, fight through uh, words and poems and so on. And one of the other poems in the book, as you might remember, is Line by Line for Joseph Brodsky, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, trying to make me familiar with Akmatova and so on, and and my own take on trying to absorb that, you know, yeah. Definitely. And I mean, I think one of the other really interesting things that's happening in this book is that there are these different layers, I think, or that's what it seemed to me, that we get some unsettling kind of childhood memories, and then there are poems, I think, of exile, there are poems of immigration. And I, I was wondering, as I, as I was reading the book again and again, was... Is the book a kind of attempt to to reconcile those different moments of life or those different periods of life and attempt somehow to to make connections between them or to fold those layers back onto each other maybe well the the, the whole idea I think of I've been trying to write to all the time in in my previous books and especially this one is how you straddle this life lived in two places, you know, um, being an immigrant, you know, um, the life that is in the, in the memory, the life that, that is a kind of a longing for what you've left, and the life of real life of where you are and the day-to-day -day, uh, events and so yeah. on. So trying to write those. In, in books before, what I did was I separated the poems by saying, okay, these are the New York poems or, and, and these are the Trinidad poems and so on. In this book, you might notice there's no separation yeah. at all, that the poems go from one country to the other, one after the other, you know, without any desire to say, well, here we are or, or there we are, you know. And... It, I guess in a way, I was, um, I think Andrew ba Bagu, one of the people who wrote blurbs, he said, uh, there are no borders anymore here, that we can remove the borders and, and have the poems really speak through experiences that, that are pretty similar wherever you are in the world. You know, yeah. it's just the, the climate is different. And 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 um, one of the things you know, I I, I asked my grandson. I said, um, "What do you think this thing about warm snow means?" You know, and he says, "He says, well, I I I, I love snow, but sometimes I wish it were warm." You know, <laughs> I, I, yeah, because and and I'm just trying to express the desire of the immigrant, right, who comes from a warm climate who will come and admire that snow and so on, but somewhere in his heart, wish that it were warm, wish that it, there were no, you know, like that, you know? Yeah. Um, 
There's a joke they tell about some guy who goes to Canada and who writes home all the time from August into September into October about how beautiful it is and then the snow falls and how beautiful it is until he gets to January and then it's not so <laughs> beautiful anymore. <laughs> so so the, the idea of warm snow, I think, is the, the heart of the immigrant yeah. talking about what he... What he what he wishes for, or what he what he remembers, all those things are caught up in the idea of warm snow. I think that's really true, and I think one of the things that I was thinking with that with that idea of warm snow is because it's such a clever metaphor. I think is almost that it's kind of a thwarted expectation somehow, isn't it? Or almost like that jarring reality of going, oh, there's yeah. snow, but it's not warm, or an expectation that I've come from a warm climate, so. It's a, and then suddenly meeting this kind of freezing other thing. And it's so interesting to, to have that warm snow, I guess, as, a, as an overarching metaphor for a lot of what's happening in the book, I think. I got, I got lucky because I, I didn't come up with it all by myself. <laughs> I, <laughs> I went to um, a museum in New York called the Folk Art Museum. And uh, my friend Susanna Case, who I, I really thank for uh, w walking with me along the way with this book, and we do as much for each other. But we went to this folk art museum, and um, look, you know, it's a, it's a museum of outside art, as they call it, right? And they, and there, looking at at some exhibit, some quiet afternoon, I came across um, something done by a man named Joseph Bach and um, outsider artist, and he's describing a piece of his work. Uh, and I'll just like qu very quickly read the line uh, yeah. in which he describes the work. He, he, it says, interior of some marvelous large islands at two million meters above sea level, unexplored, uninhabitable by civilized beings, a country of warm snow. So it's a really a fantasy place, you know, that, that this, this outsider artist makes up because I am imagining that no place he has been has pleased him in terms of... <laughs> so he created an island of warm snow. And I thought, how, how appropriate, right? Because there is the land that you travel to, but yeah. there's also the land that you make up in your mind, the, the land you imagine that would be perfect. It would be just what you want, you know. I think that's, I love that idea, the land that you, both the land that you travel to and the land that you kind of invent in your mind. And if people have got any questions for Mervyn, please do write them in the box and I'll kind of um, relay them. But I wonder then if the collection becomes that place of, of the imagination, doesn't it? That's both able to represent the real place but also be a kind of slightly heightened version of it somehow. And I love that idea, like you said, there are no borders or boundaries anymore, that both the places do fold into each other, don't they? I, I love that about, like you said, there's not a section of poems from here, and then here's the new section of poems about this other place, that they interweave yeah. with each other. And so we could be on that imagined kind of island, couldn't we, of warm snow? It could be a place where both those, where both those geographies are allowed to exist together, I guess. And it's always a matter of perspective, right? How you see things, you know? Because for each and every person, whether immigrant or, or wherever you, you happen to be, there's always some idea of what life is and what, the, what place is that you sort of invent for yourself. Even from childhood, you're making up uh, p favorite places and so on, right? And of course, we think we become adult and then we adjust and we say, well, no, there's the reality. But always, always we're making it up, you know, yeah, as yeah. we go, you know, with the hope that um, somehow this magical notion will fit with the real stuff, that, <laughs> it, that it'll become part of it and that we can invite others in too, you know. My brother, who traveled to America long before I did. If you notice, there are many poems to him in this book. Yeah. You know? and, and part of the, the whole um, imaginary thing, there's a poem in there called How It Looked, How It Looked, which is a poem about a, a photograph that he sent to Trinidad. And I'm young, I, I've never been away. And, I, and this photograph, he's standing in the snow with his wife next to this beautiful big automobile and I, I so I, I assumed that this car belonged to them you know 
which and then when he finally came back to Trinidad, I said, "Wow, I'm I'm so proud of my brother. You know, he's looking like a big shot with the coat and stuff <laughs> and the, the car." And then I say, "Oh, that car." And he says, "He says no, it's not mine. He says it just it just happened to be there on the street, and we stood <laughs> next and took a picture." But but you know what I mean. So part of what life is is, and I think what people work for to get to get money to get some comfort is to create that imaginary place that, 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 that where they feel happy. And, and of course, the more you mature, the more you realize that it's not just about your comfort, but the comfort of others too. Mm. So you begin to lend some energy into making other people more comfortable, making them less miserable perhaps. <laughs> you know? So some of, the po some of the poems are about people who are in dire straits, right? Like yeah, there's yeah. the woman there's the woman who travels to, to Chicago to, to look for her son, just hoping to see him, and then she doesn't, you know, and next year she'll go again, you yeah. know, and, and that's, the, that's, the, that's the pain of, of that, of life, you know. Yeah. And so that idea of, I guess, poetry as, you know, because again, young poets tend to, you know, we can sometimes fall into a trap, I guess, of writing purely about the self, can't we? And this is how I feel, and I feel sad, or I feel happy about this. But that, that notion that poetry is empathy, or poetry is a kind of democratic thing that, that reaches out and kind of can, can show the people's lives or show that suffering, that, that, you know, that's a really vital thing, isn't it? And something that a lot of people forget that poetry should be doing, I think, sometimes. Absolutely. You know, um, that the, that the, uh, yesterday I saw a, a, a video of, of one vagrant um, um, helping to wash another. It's raining heavily and the spout is coming, of water is coming down. And, and, and one man is behind the other and actually scrubbing his friend, you know, giving the vag vagrant a, a shower in the street, you know. And I'm looking at the reaction of people in the street, you know, everybody's laughing and so on. But I said, I thought how vital that is, right? Yeah. That, 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 that they, it doesn't matter about who's looking on. It matters that you're helping, helping your friend, that you're doing something for him that, that is absolutely necessary, you know? Yeah. And it's funny, that poem about Sheriff, about the African tailor, I tried to share it with him, but because he doesn't read English, you know, he, he didn't quite understand that I meant it as a, as a gift right, at first. Yeah, right? yeah. He, he didn't quite, but 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 it's my way of giving giving him something, you know, yeah. because I I think the effort that people put into trying to cope is just superhuman. Yeah, poetry is about nothing if it's not about underlining that that attempt. To, to be somewhere, to be somebody, yeah. you know. I think that's such yeah. a beautiful thought. And I just wonder, Mervyn, could you, you know, we've talked a lot about the book. We've kind of gone into some different themes and things. But before we finish our chat, would you read us another poem from, from the collection, please? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I thought I might read the, the title poem. Yes. Country of, Country of Warm Snow for Courtney. You stop by, feet swollen from sleeping, sitting up. When I think of how we entered this city, separating through the streets in the months after, I pictured a state you had gotten lost in, east, west perhaps, one of the dry ones like Nevada. Never afraid to dream, your idea of America remained what we had seen in the movies fields where men keep rounding the bases, cheeks red with October chill. That first winter you said the snow looked warm, and now someone's promised you a cot in a basement. You grin with delight, as if the offer has redeemed whatever wrong was done to you. Thank you so much, Mervyn. That was just beautiful. And it's been just a joy to chat to you as well. I'm so pleased that you've been able to join us. Um, and thank you for this book as well. It's just magnificent. Thank you so much. Thanks for Poetry Book Society for choosing it. You know, that's a real honor. I appreciate it, guys. Yeah. Thank you very you much. We talk for hours again, but I, you have to go and...
<laughs> that's it. That's it. I'm gonna have to. I'll kick you out, and then I'll bring Nina in. But thank you so much, Mervin, and hopefully we'll talk again soon. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you. Appreciate. It. Okay. Bye now. Bye bye. So that was the great Mervyn Taylor with Country of Warm Snow and he finished off with the title poem then um, and I'm pleased the connection could work. I'm sorry if it was a little bit crackly. Um, that was because I had deverishly thrown off the headphones but I've got them back on now so it's all good. And now, um, by the magic of technology, I'm going to bring in um, Nina and we'll get on with the second half of the show. Hello, Nina. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Is this all okay? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. So thank you so much for joining us um, for this evening, me. Nina. Um, and it was just such a joy again and a thrill to be able to recommend um, this debut collection for um, to our readers and to members of the Poetry Book Society. I wonder, before we get into anything else, um, if you'd like to read us a poem to give us a flavour of the collection. I'd love to, yeah. Um, as well as today being National Poetry Day. It's also Mid-Autumn Moon Festival, which is a really important um, traditional Chinese festival um, and celebrated all over East and Southeast Asia. Um, so I'll read my Moon Festival poem. Mid-Autumn Moon Festival 2016. The city is turning, the trees are turning. We are walking and then swimming through a sea of yellow leaves when Louise stops to bite a perfect persimmon. Her front teeth pierce the skin and she is laughing. I remember my mum cutting persimmons in the sun one afternoon. Soft orange bits stuck to her palm. We look up the Chinese name for persimmon on my phone. Shi zi. We taste the word. We cut it open, wondering at how it sounds so like the word for lion. Shi zi, lion fruit, like a tiny roaring sun, shiny lion fruit. At dusk, we sit outside cutting mooncakes into quarters with a plastic knife, peering at their insides. Candied peanut or purple yam, matcha or red bean. The moon looks like a single scoop of red bean ice cream, but really it's a girl who ate her beloved, then swallowed the sun he gave her as a gift. Oh, there's always so much to be lovesick for when seasons change. Green bird cages and plastic moon goddesses and pink undies hanging up to dry above the street mm -hmm. and boys who only text at night. <laughs> we lick the sugar off our wrists and it's been so long, so long. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Nina. That's such a beautiful point to start on. And just to start us off, I, I was interested because you write kind of brilliantly across kind of different genres, different mediums. Um, and so this isn't your first kind of publication in the world. And you've done poetry pamphlets, but it's the first kind of full length poetry collection. And I yeah. just wondered how that feels to, to kind of have that in the world and, and kind of how it felt to build up to that and then to, to finally publish it. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing. It's still surreal to even hold the book. Um, <laughs> it came out in July, but I guess time is moving in a very strange way at this time. Yeah. So like, it kind of feels like it was a long time ago, but also like just last week. So it's very strange. Um, it's amazing. It's a beautiful object. Um, you're right. I've done, I've got a lot of pamphlets and zines that I've made myself and like published myself over the years but it's the first time that they're all in a book. And mm. my first thought like before, before the pandemic was that it would just be great to not have to print out my poems anymore. <laughs> when, I go, <laughs> when I go to readings, obviously now I'm not going to any readings, but I can still read from my book. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's amazing. It's really, really exciting. Fantastic. And I think one of the things that, um, again, people that have already got the book will have seen, but if not, kind of they'll see when they get hold of it, is the really exciting work that you're doing with form, I think, in this book. Because there are some poems that we get in stanzas, but there are some that are almost kind of sections of lyric essay in kind of numbered sections. And also I was really excited 
by because I'm nerdy and I get excited by things like this by the use of the slash to kind of <laughs> in the middle of lines in really interesting ways and I just wondered you know I'm always curious as a poet does does each poem kind of suggest its form as you're writing it or is it something that it has to find after a first draft after a kind of initial kind of splurge or just kind of I'm interested in in how you know what form a poem should kind of arrive in yeah that's a really great question I think that's the question I'm like constantly asking myself as well <laughs> I think it depends I think I figured out that um most of the time I will have to try and like just get an idea down or get an image down and not think about form just like as a way of getting something on the page and then it will be like drafting through drafting that the form might come and probably through reading because I often yeah. through reading other poetry I'll find like a, a form that's really exciting um but then there's a rare occasion when it will just come like fully formed and I don't know how <laughs> I think <laughs> I think this is um maybe you can relate a lot of poets Maybe sometimes it's really, really difficult and other times it's like the idea has been there in my brain for a long time. Um, yeah. And it's like it couldn't it couldn't come out onto the page until it was ready. Basically sounding like giving birth to a poem, but that's like what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and so there's like a couple, maybe two, maybe three in the book that I do remember just kind of had the form already. That's interesting. And, and I still don't know how that works. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's so interesting. And I mean, you know, with those slashes, even in that opening poem, they just give this really interesting movement, I think, in poems. So you get that, that opening few lines. I remember the sound the sword made when she cut off all her hair. It sounded like my mother cutting fabric, those blue scissors clutched in her small hand. And so each slash in that is like an act, is acting like a cut or it's acting like a swish again, isn't it? Just... Mm -hmm. And, and I'm fascinated by, you know, the line and the movement in that are singing so well together that the sense of the line and the form of it are kind of in sync and singing together. And again, is that something that, you know, I, I kind of look in, on in awe of that as a poet because I just think I couldn't, like, I'm not that clever somehow. And I wonder again if, you know, does the line come and then you think, oh, I might construct it like that later? Or is it a sense in which maybe that's one where, they both suggest the, the both I both kind of different sides of that come at once maybe mm, I think in, in that case maybe it comes together um particularly with punctuation I guess I really like I really like punctuation like I, I can't not use punctuation <laughs> and I I like using it in in kind of you know unconventional ways although the slash I would say is like quite uh, quite an established kind of line break tool yeah, yeah. for a I really like using it as a um like a, a separator between mm. standards or between even in prose like in between paragraphs so I think I just really I really like the way that you can break up words on the page and I think I'm quite often trying to do that um when I'm writing I'm like um wanting to kind of disrupt the space on the page disrupt the line disrupt the rhythm yeah. i also like the way that a slash i think um jane Kamane and i were talking about this in the editing process she's such an incredible editor and she was like asking me about my slashes <laughs> and, like, because, <laughs> which i think is great because it's important to like consider why you've used a particular mm. uh like why a slash why not a comma or a semicolon um and um, she was wondering if it was to do with breath. And I really like that. Um, I think previously I thought of commas as a kind of breath, like a breathing point. Mm. But I think a slash is even more like a kind of like a, um, like a like intake of yeah. breath. It could be, it might not be. But in some cases, I think I do use it that way. I love thinking of it like that as a kind of intake of breath. I think that's really interesting. And I mean, one of the, as I was kind of, again, rereading and rereading the book, um, we get that poem, I mean, several, but one that I kind of alighted on today as I was rereading, the poem in, in two voices. Mm. And the title itself, which is kind of Magnolia Mulan, so we get the kind of dual language 
kind of um, no, um, element of the title. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if poetry does is is that then a way of kind of holding those different voices, all those different languages, in a way where they can both coexist? And I wondered if that was something that poetry could maybe do not better, but is that something that poetry has a capacity to do that maybe some other genres of writing don't necessarily? That somehow there's something about the line of the poem that is able to hold different voices like that or hold these different elements of different languages together in a way, not necessarily to reconcile them, but just in order to give them both some equal space, I guess. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. Um, I think in poetry you can hold so much I think the form is flexible and like it expands to to fill to be filled with whatever you need to fill it with I think that's why I find mm. poetry to be the most um the most freeing form to write in but then it it kind of it makes me try hard when I write prose to basically fit fit in those things that I try to fit in with poetry <laughs> which it yeah, is yeah. Always like <laughs> um, but it's all good for me so I think I think that's why I would say I'm like although I write essays and things I would say I'm first and foremost a poet because it can actually a poem can hold so much and you can without anyone needing to give you permission or without having to be too like um, to clear about it you can place these voices right next to each other on, on a page um, and that's really exciting to me I think that's also maybe what M Mervyn was talking about um, mm. with how his I love how he said his the structure of his book there's no borders yeah like um, being able to hold the different locations of the immigrant life I think that's completely like also sums up um, how I feel. <laughs> I think that's really interesting and I, and I love the idea of the poem kind of being able to hold those different things and therefore kind of make connections or make points without having to do it obviously like there's a beautiful subtlety to this book where it it, it speaks to me and it kind of I feel like it makes these incredibly profound points but it never kind of points at me off the page and says this is what this poem thinks or this is what i'm saying in this poem which again is a trap that i think some poets fall into and i'm, I'm fascinated as you say by that is there's something about maybe then the space of the poem that just allows the language to do that heavy lifting for us or the poem itself can do that work without the poet's voice having to intrude too much into it maybe mm, yeah i think what you describe of like wanting to maybe state what this is about or how you feel straight up I think I definitely first came to writing with a bit that maybe we all do hmm. um and I think it's only been through like quite a few years of reading mainly hmm. and yeah lots of writing and, and lots of editors and teachers you know kind of yeah, yeah. that I become maybe I've become better at like trusting, trusting the image and yeah. relying on the language. Um, and so that, so that I can take a kind of step back, although I still like, I still like writing from a more personal perspective, but hmm. I enjoy playing with it and being experimental. I love that idea of trusting the image. That feels like such an important, I'm going to steal that and use that for my <laughs> students if that's all right. I think that's a, yeah. great, that's a great phrase. Um, I hate to ask this next question because if someone asked it of me, it would put me on the spot too much. But <laughs> Mervyn mentioned um, kind of Derek Walcott's influence and how important he'd been. And when we've chatted to other poets in the past, they've just mentioned kind of poets who I guess, not necessarily that word influence, because that sometimes feels too heavy, but just if there were any writers or poets who you maybe felt over your shoulder or on your shoulder as you'd kind of been writing this book or any poets mm -hmm. who you who you kind of, I often find like influence is too heavy because then people flick back through the book and go wait I can't see that person because <laughs> sometimes influence is more subtle than that but just any kind of I guess presiding voices that you felt might have been around mm -hmm. as, as you were kind of writing some of these poems. I feel I love the idea of um, maybe poets that were sitting on my shoulder I think mm -hmm. that's quite accurate because 
at the time because these were these were written most of these poems were written sort of four maybe five years ago okay um I, and and it was around then that I first read Night Sky with Exit Wounds by Ocean Vuong, um, which had a profound effect on me, I think, in ways I still, you know, won't kind of fully understand, but I think it maybe comes through in the book, mm. is kind of the way he can, like, bend images and, and use colour and texture, and it's just incredible, but... um. Others, I think, I think Anne Carson is always mm -hmm. here somewhere um, from the beginning. Yeah, and always. And I think maybe to some extent, Sarah Howe, um, mm. who I've been really lucky to, like more recently, I've met her and she's so wonderful. But long before then, like when her first, when her book came out, um, it was just, it was kind of a first, first time I recognized um, something about what she was trying to do maybe similar to what I'm doing and also mm. just reading a book by a poet who has kind of a similar background to me yeah, yeah. um it was really special but I think we're very different poets and I love that too yeah 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 definitely I think that's, well that's a great reading list for people that are listening as well if they haven't read Ocean <laughs> or Anne Carson or Sarah Howe yeah. um, to go and get those books I, I wasn't going to ask this but just because you mentioned it I'm fascinated you were saying a lot of these poems were written kind of maybe four or five years ago mm -hmm. or that's what and I just wonder kind of what your relationship to them is then now so obviously they come together as a book so they feel kind of new or they're in a new kind of binding as it were but what is do, do you feel kind of differently to towards them than you did obviously when you first wrote them or something like that or how does it feel to be kind of almost looking back into the past with them somehow now that it's out as a book yeah it's really odd isn't it um there's definitely some that like i just don't really like reading all the <laughs> you know i think we all we all have those that just feel like they're written by someone else of course they were yeah. but that's but still, I think I love that this book contains like a particular time of my life, which was now, yeah. you know, five years ago. And so I like that they kind of, they come from that, they preserve that. And so now I would say I've changed a bit as a writer and I can tell that, but I've tried to like not, not cringe too much at any of these. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it is strange because some of them I've, I've like, read especially the very first poem girl warrior i've that's one that i've like done at poetry readings since yeah 2016 so that feels like a really old <laughs> poem <laughs> but of course it isn't um yeah i love that to some to some people though they're of course that's in a brand new yeah. yeah it also though kind of makes me feel impatient and spurs me on to like write newer things and keep working on something new because I'm like, oh, all those old poems in that book, <laughs> um, and I want to like have more material that's newer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, it's a weird one. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I mean, as well, I think food felt really important both in its actuality but in what it can bring through images in this book as well and i know you've written the the food memoir in the past as well and in one particular poem um spring onion pancakes one there's a it feels as though the land, landscape and geography is able to be explored and come to the fore through the preparation of that meal and through the preparation of, of food and i just wonder if that as a that as a kind of motif i guess or that as a medium to explore maybe bigger spaces and and just how you feel that you know is, is that true or have i just made that up or <laughs> kind of ha how that functions within the collection i guess yeah i love um i love that reading of it i hadn't noticed you're right there's um there's a mountain in that poem isn't there yeah um i mean i think for me i'm basically always thinking about food <laughs> like, like I'm either eating or cooking or I'm like thinking about what I'm going to eat or cook next <laughs> and so it's like I think it's inevitable that I will kind of end up writing about food and that those images will kind of um, connect to like you say landscape I love that or you know memories from a long long time ago um, yeah. 
or questions of language and displacement. Um, yeah, it's such a huge subject. And actually, I do find writing about food really difficult. Maybe that's why I keep kind of trying. Um, yeah. Yeah. But again, there's that subtlety in it as well, isn't there? I think it's that, as you said earlier, letting the image do the work. Because the poems, you know, in that poem that I kind of mentioned with the mountain, it never says, and this reminds me of this because of this. It just kind of places those ideas together. And as a reader, then we step into that space. And I think that's so important that it, it as a reader, I kind of have to step then into that space and look at that image and that. So it, it's a collection, I guess, that, that I felt certainly I had to be an active reader of. Which is a really exciting thing that he could, you know, I had to kind of step into that space, I guess, which was really exciting. Um, we've, we've got about five minutes left mm. before the end. Um, so I wonder, first of all, if you just wanted to maybe read us another poem, Nina. Yeah, sure. Maybe I'll read the best poem. Yes. If we've got five minutes. Yeah. Girl Warrior, or Watching Mulan in Chinese with English subtitles. <laughs> One. I remember the sound the sword made when she cut off all her hair. A sound like my mother cutting fabric. Those blue scissors clutched in her small hands. I remember wondering why she didn't cut from the roots. A Disney princess kneeling in the smoke-coloured dark with straight hair. Thin waists, hardly any breasts. Unlike me with my thick legs and too much hair that doesn't stay. Why don't we cut it short, she said, and so we did. But soon it curled sideways, ungracefully caught in the wind of some perpetual hurricane. Two. When I watch Mulan in Chinese with English subtitles, I understand only some of the words. My focus shifts to certain details. How Mulan drags a very large cannon across the snow with very small wrists. How the villain has skin as dark as coal and such small eyes he has no irises. Once a guy told me mixed girls are the most beautiful because they aren't really white, but they aren't really Asian either. Three. After Mulan saves China, fireworks rain down in waves of multicolored stars. You fight pretty good, says her boyfriend with the big American arms. I have small victories too, being kind to my body for one day, not checking my phone for your texts, walking home at night alone and not feeling lonely. Or, why don't you ever write about yourself? And I didn't know why either. In Chinese, one word can lead you out of the dark, then back into it in a single breath. Shut off the light, as my mother and other Chinese mothers say. Now, open it. Five. When Mulan returns home, the colours change from grey, blue, green to pink, warm yellow. There are plum blossoms floating in the stream. Her hair is still a little messy to make sure we don't forget. She used to be something else. <laughs> Six. When summer ended, rain poured off the edge of elevated highways and washed away the moon. I no longer have a sword, but sometimes at night I hold my keys between my fingers. I paint my lips. I draw avalanches. I light fires inside dream palaces. I cut my hair of the bathroom sink. Beautiful. Thank you so much. And what a just a Thanks. spectacular place to end, Nina. Yeah. And thank you so much for, for being so generous um, in answering our questions and for sharing your work with us tonight. And thank you for just for this book, which I was just so honoured and thrilled to, to choose as um, Approach Book Society recommendation. So thank you oh, so much. Thank you. And I hope you enjoy the rest of National Poetry Day. Yeah, you too. And thanks, <laughs> Patricia, as well. It's lovely to meet her. Hi, Patricia. She's been a bit naughty this evening, but we'll let her <laughs> off. Cause it's, she's overexcited with National Poetry Day, yeah, so it's fine. Of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as we all are um, but thank you very much everyone for um, joining us and do check out both Mervyn and Nina's books online at the PBS and look out for the winter 2020 selections as well we'll speak to you soon bye now <laughs>